Good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Withrow. I'm the head of exhibitions and publications here at the McMichael. The creator has given us a beautiful weather day today on a, a day that we reflect on the painful legacies of uh, and painful truths about uh, the past in our country, indigenous resident, uh, residential schools and uh, legacies that continue to impact um, our society today. I um, will begin with a land acknowledgement. The McMichael Canadian Art Collection is located on the territory of the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation, the original lands of the Ojibwe, Anishinaabe and Huron Wendat people. McMichael is uniquely situated along the Carrying Place Trail which historically provided an integral connection for Indigenous people between Ontario's Lakeshore and the Lake Simcoe Georgian Bay region. Um, I'd like to extend a warm greeting to our honoured guests today, Bonnie Devine and Christine Lukasavich. Um, Christine has brought with her some family, friends and elders from her Madawaska Algonquin community and some friends from Six Nations and other Indigenous communities across Ontario. So we greet you warmly as well. Sarah will give a, a more a uh, thorough bio of our speakers today. You're here to speak, uh, to hear them, so I will hand over to Sarah. Sarah Milroy is our Chief Curator and uh, Incoming Executive Director here at the McMichael. She is one of our country's most respected voices and champions of Canadian art, both historic and contemporary. She has been our Chief Curator here since 2018, and in those five years has curated or co-curated over a dozen exhibitions, uh, many of which have toured across the country. So I'll hand over to you, Sarah. And I haven't done any of those things without Jennifer's help, just to be clear. Um, welcome everyone today and thanks for being with us. We are so thrilled to have our guests here today, particularly. Um, we're surrounded in this room by the works of Norval Morisot and Daphne Ojig. And I, I was thinking, um, you know, I'm originally from British Columbia and it took me a while to kind of move into Ontario to kind of appreciate Norval Morisot because the colors are so searingly bright. And you know, as I was driving up here today, I was thinking, well, this is why the colors are so searingly bright, because this land in eastern Canada, very different than the west, has these cobalt blue days, like today, and these glorious fall colors. And I, I kind of feel like uh, that has found its way into the, into the sort of DNA of, of, of Norval's work. And it's always a, a great pleasure to gather in this room with, uh, with, with Norval and Daphne's works around it. I feel like the McMichael was built for days like this, um, to celebrate the beauty of the land that we're on, but also to serve as a meeting place where we can come together. A place on this national day of truth and reconciliation, where our indigenous visitors can feel honored and welcomed, and where our settler audiences can listen and learn. Uh, I will have two remarkable women with me on the stage today. Christine Lakasavich is Omami Winini Madawaskarini Anishinaabekwe, Crane Clan, a woman of the Madawaska River Algonquin people. She is the director of Waseya Consulting and Waseya Cultural Tours, and is involved with all sorts of educational initiatives, mostly in and around the land currently called Algonquin Park. She has a BA from Acadia, and I think, um, Christine, I'm right that you're still working to complete the master's in Indigenous Studies from Trent University. <laughs> she's looking a little stressed about that, but we have faith. Um, and she's also currently writing her first book, a, a True History, as she puts it, of the Algonquin people from an Anishinaabekwe perspective. Christine is a gifted writer, and those who've read our Tom Thompson catalog will know that she's contributed an essay on her complex relationship to the works of Tom Thompson, which began in her teenage years. And she brings to that essay, I encourage everyone to read it, um, the complexity of looking at it from her Algonquin heritage, but also from her mixed settler heritage, heritage and trying to sort of find her place in relation to those works which she loves, but also which are, you know, problematic in, in ways that we'll explore today. Christine lives in Whitney, Ont in Ontario, just east of what is now Algonquin Park, and she's traveled here today, as Jen mentioned, with a great gang of people from her community there, so once again, we welcome you all. Bonnie Devine uh, will be in conversation with Christine today, and Bonnie is an Anishinaabe Ojibwe 
art, the installation artist, curator, filmmaker, sculptor, writer, educator, and a member of Ganabiching and Anishinaabek Serpent River First Nation on the North Shore of Lake Huron, a place I've never been, but I hope one day to travel to it. It must be so very beautiful. You will all have seen her installation from water to water away through the trees as you came up the ramp today. And she has made this work bringing attention to the deeper ancestral history of the land that the Michael is situated on and the region more generally. She is also the co-editor of the forthcoming publication, Early Days, Indigenous Art from the McMichael, an exhibition which is currently touring in the US of, of works from our permanent collection, which is a third of our collection at the McMichael is Indigenous, we're proud to say. And that publication will be out in November and will be the biggest publication in our institution's history. And she has been absolutely central to every aspect of the creation of that publication. And we are so grateful, Bonnie, for your help with that. Many honors have marked Bonnie's career, perhaps most notably the Eidelborg Fellowship in 2011 and the Governor General's Award for Media and Visual Arts in 2021. She was the founder of the Indigenous Visual Culture Program at OCAD University, a trailblazing endeavor, and she taught at OCAD for many years following her own academic training at OCAD and York University. Bonnie, my thanks for all the gifts that you have brought us over these last few years of working together so closely and for your presence here today. So without any further ado, why don't we gather on the stage and I'll sit here and perhaps you two would join me in the, in the two chairs on the side. Thanks so much for your kind attention. My name is Christine, I'm from the Crane Clan. I am Madawaskarini Algonquin, living in my ancestral territory at the headwaters of the Madawaska. Um, I am Algonquin Anishinaabe, as well as mixed settler ancestry, kind of that hardy Ottawa Valley mix of Polish, Irish, German, and Swedish. Um, I want to, uh, again, thank everyone for being here, but in particular, elders in my community, including my father, Dan Lukasavich, Ethel Lavalley, and Dan Bowers, um, as well as those of you who are part of my community, uh, my family and friends, and I'm so honored to share this space with you today. Um, I live within eyesight of the Algonquin Park boundary, and it's not lost on me that the place that I live is really a result of this long history that I am but a small part of. Um, I've spent the majority of my life living in Whitney, other than you know a few forays kind of on the East Coast, a few forays on the West Coast, but that is ultimately my home. Um, Algonquin Park is a place that I love deeply, and I know many of you in this room, it's also a place that you hold so close to your heart. Uh, it is an honor to be here in Chimigwitch to the McMichael Canadian Art Collection, to Bonnie Devine, but as well to, uh, to Sarah Milroy, who brought my writing from one place to a whole other ballgame. So Chimigwitch, Sarah. A good writer needs a good editor. <laughs> or two, or three, or four. Um, she, I'll get you to go to the next slide, please. So this is a map um, taken from Native Land Digital. Native Land is a, um, an online free tool that talks about indigenous territories, languages, and treaties from around the world. In the center, you will see um, Omama Winnie or Algonquin territory, and you can kind of, just in the very center there, but you'll see the Ottawa River, the Kitchissippi that runs through it. So as, um, as Algonquin people, we are intrinsically connected to land. Um, the character of our territory shapes our identity. We are people of the rivers and even our names and, and the way that we identify comes from those rivers and those waterways. Those waterways have provided endless routes for us to make our way through our territory, to hunt, to fish, to gather, and really to, to not only survive, but to thrive, which we continue to do so. Um, traditionally, Omama Winnie or Algonquin territory stretched from Trois Rivières in the east, Lake Nipissing to the west, south to the Adirondack Mountains in New York, and north above Lake Abitibi. 
Our ancestral knowledge tells us that we've been here since time immemorial. Um, however, in the past couple of hundred years, the results of the, um, the impacts of settler colonialism and settler policies, um, Algonquin territory uh, is now down to the lands and waters on both sides of the Ottawa River watershed. So 1613 is the first marked time that we know of a European being in Algonquin territory with Samuel de Champlain. Champlain, on his arrival here, was able to witness um, an abundance of plants and wildlife, animals, so on. He kind of wrote back home to say, you know, this, this new land, this, this region is full. It's got an abundance of, of resources and kind of invited people in. Um, just kind of, you know, it's really hard to, to fit about 450 years of history or really who knows how long. So if we say since time immemorial, fit, fit that much amount of history into 25 minutes. But essentially, to kind of skip ahead through following that first European, that contact that we know of, um, there was extensive resource extraction in the forms of fur and, uh, and timber, as well as colonial settlement that have had um, incredible impacts on our livelihoods, as well as just simply on our populations. We do know that um, European presence brought along diseases, as well as a number of other traumas, which is part of the reason why we're gathered here today. So Algonquin petitions to the Crown to make sure that our ancestral territory is um, able to, to continue to provide for us, to sustain our families. Um, the first petition began in 1772. Most of them have gone unanswered and most of them still continue to this day. Um, we know that through those petitions, as newcomers were beginning to settle in Algonquin territory and really start to push us to the fringes, um, we know that Algonquin people felt threat at that point in time that we weren't able to like to really continue to survive in our ancestral homelands. Um, as I had mentioned, uh, Algonquin territory was originally divided, you know, based on these um, these riverways and these waterways and landscapes, but. Eventually, it was divided into Upper and Lower Canada in 1791. Um, and since that point, it's continued to be carved out based on colonial boundaries and uh, you know, provincial parks, crown land, private ownership, and so on. So the Kitchissippi, or the Ottawa River, um, was once the heart of our homeland, but now with the provinces of Ontario and Quebec and sort of that imaginary line drawn through the Ottawa River, that river is now a symbol of what really divides us as a nation. Those colonial, provincial boundaries have started to separate us, and, and there's a lot of healing that we need to do. And so, since the arrival of settlers in Algonquin Territory in the past 400 years, um, we have been adversely affected by the division of our territories. Um, we are fractured as a result of that colonial imposition on our lands, and we are divided by these complex layers of colonial history. Um, which Sarah had alluded to. I am the physical embodiment of the coming together of a number of people in one particular place. But that's kind of the beauty of it. Now we're able to share these places with folks who are part of our community, your friends and our neighbors and some of the people that we hold closest. Shay, I'll get you to, to move to the next slide, please. So my ancestral territory, oh, you got Anybody who knows me, technology is so not my thing. There we go. All right, we're rocking and rolling now. Okay, so um, my ancestral territory is the headwaters of the Madawaska Sibi or the Madawaska River, which is now in present-day Algonquin Park, starting at Source Lake. I love Algonquin Park. In so many ways, it has really brought me to be the person that I am spent countless hours canoe tripping and just being out on land and getting to know those plant and animal kin who I share those spaces with and just really appreciate the beauty of the land. So in 1893, Algonquin Park was created following some unsustainable resource extraction. Kind of the saying goes that um, when some of the first timber harvesters arrived, there was enough uh, timber to last for 700 years, but within 70 years it was gone. So we know that that landscape was severely impacted. The abundance of pine and wildlife um, in that, or remaining pine and wildlife, um, helped to inspire the creation of Algonquin Park as a timber reserve and a wildlife sanctuary. Ironically, it was suggested that the first of Ontario's parks, which was then actually Algonquin National Park, as you can see on the map here, this is that original map from 1893. 
But as far as the name goes, and often when I'm working with kids, I'll say, you know, who here thinks that Algonquin Park is named after Algonquin people? And oftentimes, you would think that would be the easy answer, but it's not. It's said that um, Algonquin Park uh, was named in this way, perpetuating the memory of one of the greatest Indian nations that inhabited the North American continent. They included the Nipissing, Odawa, Montagnier, Delaware, Wendat, Mississauga, and over 30 different tribes. They were referring to the Algonquian language group and deliberately ignoring the Algonquian people who were still living within the boundaries of Algonquin Park at this time. So the creation of this iconic wilderness space did lead to the forced displacement of my family and many other Algonquin families, um, indigenous families from neighboring, uh, neighboring nations as well, but also settler families, including my Irish family in the Bonnershire region of Algonquin Park. And so with Tom Thompson coming to know Algonquin Park beginning in May 1912 until his sudden death in 1917, let's take a look at what the Algonquin Park is that Tom would have known back then. So this, uh, this entire content is with special thanks to my, my dear friend Rory Mackay, who is uh, Algonquin, the Algonquin Park historian. So Thompson's connection to Algonquin, a place that we know that he loved and where he felt that he belonged, um, we can see this through the way, that, um, the way that he represents exactly what the Algonquin Park landscape is like, even to this day. And for anyone who may have read uh, the piece that I wrote for the catalog, there is a little bit that I talk about in there about you know really actually knowing those clouds. I say those clouds still show up from time to time, even though he had painted this a long time ago. Thompson's Algonquin was familiar but different. Um, it was a time when it was well understood that fresh air was good for your health. There were no fiberglass or lightweight canoes. You were really going to be portaging with cedar strips or birch bark canoes, often made by Algonquin canoe builders. Tents were cotton or canvas and not the super light and packable ones we're used to today. So just imagine, you know, portaging that. And I know some folks from Camp Pathfinder who are here, they know all about portaging those heavy cedar strip canoes. Um, logging was more visible at that point in time, and we see that show up in some of Thompson's works. There were no buffer zones around kind of those public-facing areas. Almost everything revolved around the train, which made regular stops throughout different stations in Algonquin. Residents lived year-round and really depended on that train in order to get the supplies that they had need, or needed. Um, park staff would diligently watch those coming in by train to make sure that they were able to point out poachers or those who were being there, kind of doing those unfavorable, unfavorable things. Um, this was a big focus for park staff, looking out for poachers, indigenous peoples included. And so my family, if you think about that, my family who would have existed based on the harvesting of those, um, of those more than human beings, those, those plants, those animals, all of a sudden, those traditional lifeways were made illegal. Um, Rory has shared a quote with me saying that um, Ralph Bice, who some of you may know about, Ralph Bice said that before the highway came in, you really got to know the people in the park because they stayed longer. He said the highway was the ruination of the park. Too many people and more fishing pressure. And I noticed today on social media, day use is already at capacity here, which then in turn actually limits my ability to be within my own territory. We're limited as to where we can go unless we reserve that day permit. Algonquin was a popular spot for a lot of Americans as well too. So camps like Camp Pathfinder, Northway, Wabano, uh, Minnewawa were all owned by Americans, mostly from those uh, states including New Jersey. Um, and also, um, yeah, so really wanting to point out too, like during Thompson's time, as far as that fur harvesting went, um, park rangers actually harvested furs in order for the government to sell those furs to support Algonquin Park, which is quite ironic given that it was something that, you know, that's how we sustain ourselves, but we aren't able to do yet. Of course, for them, it's all right. So we are familiar with Thompson's Algonquin. We know what he saw. We know the places where he was. We know where he painted. But I also want to share with you, you know, that, that question of what are the other stories? What are those stories that often go unheard? So this, um, this photo here is from the Hayes Expedition um, in Algonquin Park. Um, and they are guides from uh, Majikining or Rama First Nation in 1897. 
Um, so we know, we know that indigenous guides played an integral role in having visitors to Algonquin Park be able to really experience all that Algonquin is and really get through there safely and probably haul all of their stuff with them. Um, other photos in this album do show, um, I can't remember the, his first name, but Hayes going down in a canoe with nothing in his canoe. You know, he was shooting the rapids, but not, not full of things. So you know that that photo was staged. So who was doing that dirty work? Who was doing a lot of the handling of those, those heavy things? So um, to quote Asa Navi, um, we were here. We were always here. We, we have always been within our ancestral territories, even if you didn't know that we were here. This is the ancestral territory of Algonquin, uh, Nipissing, Chippewa, and Mississauga peoples, and we still hold that ancestral connection, even if at points that, that connection has been rather thin. So these men um, from Rama First Nation, we know for sure, not that we don't know, but really the, the collective we, um, we know for sure that these guides from Rama really knew their way around Algonquin Park in the sense that they made a point to go to, um, to, to stop at this place called, called Turtle Rock. There's this massive rock that, that is in the shape of a turtle on Catfish Lake. And you can see through all those offerings that have been left behind on the land that there have been generations after generations of people coming to visit that sacred place. And much like Thompson, we too painted there, though a little bit different. Perhaps we did not paint on canvas, but we did paint with red ochre to mark our sacred places. The relationships that we hold with the land, waters, and more than human beings, even if we're not able to be physically present on the land, it still exists in our blood memory. So during Thompson's time, you know, kind of that 1914, 1917 era, if we think about that Canadian context and really why many of you are wearing orange today, this was at a point in time when residential schools were in full swing. This is at a point in time when Indigenous peoples literal existence on our ancestral territories was highly regulated by these rules, these obscure rules meant to really push us to the margins that are outlined in the Indian Act. It controls, even to this day, our identity, and then in turn, even our belonging often to our nations. The shadows of our homes still remain on the land. Um, just this summer, I was able to visit the homestead of, of my family, um, from six generations ago, where I was able to see both the foundation of the old house as well as the birch trees that they were harvesting from. And if you harvest birch the right way off of a tree, it doesn't actually hurt the tree too much. It will grow over. So those marks, our marks are still visible on the land if you know where to look. But why don't we know about this? Why don't we know these stories? And I can guarantee it's not because we haven't been trying to tell them, but really they haven't been heard. We haven't always been listened to. And so this is a photo, oh, so coordinated, there you go, all right. So um, this is a photo of my ancestors. We do not know for sure exactly what their names are, so unfortunately they are unnamed at this point in time, but it is one of the most special parts of my of my own existence that I am able to still hold in my hand. So in, just to give you a little bit more context as well, so in 1863, eight Algonquin chiefs and over 250 individual Algonquin people petitioned the crown for a large enough tract of land to be set aside as a reserve for over 400 families. And that would be more than just sort of the nuclear family that we're used to today, but you know, also encompassing aunts and uncles and cousins, and so you're having at least you know, 20 people per family. So 400 times 20, Someone who's good at math can figure that out for me. Um, so in 1866, um, Indian Affairs almost set aside a tract of land um, in what is now the southern portion of Algonquin Park, so long as Algonquins were interested in agriculture and they did not have any rights to merchantable timber, nor could they interrupt the business of those who held timber licenses. It's important to note too that the terrain of this area is one that was extremely rugged, full of rocks and hills and kind of swampy areas and therefore deemed unsuitable for any other type of settlement. By 1867, Panchimaganish, High Chief of the Algonquin and Nipissing and my ancestral grandfather seven generations back had not yet received any word on the proposed reserve lands. He again wrote a petition to the Crown in 1868 asking for an answer but received no response. So as I mentioned, Algonquin Park was created in 1893. 
Um, and in 1894, um, Chief Peter Shabbat, um, who is married to Pond's daughter, um, then petitioned the, the Crown again for those reserved lands near the then borders of Algonquin Park. In correspondence with the Crown, then Superintendent Peter Thompson wrote, the township of Lawrence is situated upon the confines of Algonquin Park, which as you know was reserved as a home for game of all descriptions, the intention being to preserve the beauty of the park and to afford a harbor for different wild animals, birds, etc., which are natives to this province. The formation of a settlement of Indians on the borders of a territory of this kind would, in my opinion, be attended with great danger to the preservation of game in the park. You know the predatory habits of these people, how they roam about, and how difficult it is to keep watch of their movements in the forest. And this was written directly about my ancestors and still exists within government archives. So in 1894, my family, their kin, our community, we were forcibly, um, forcibly removed from our ancestral territory, the place that we have known since time immemorial. Um, we've, we've still remained within that territory, but, you know, kind of in, in a, I, I find it kind of humorous. We moved just to the other side of the Algonquin Park boundary where we can still see the places that our ancestors lived. We, we did not leave that part of our territory. We had the option of going to um, nearby uh, the Algonquin Reserve at Golden Lake, now known as the Algonquin Zipikwaknagan First Nation, but that was a place that was already really full of people. And again, it was kind of that undesirable tract of land. Um, and so by staying in our territory, so close to the headwaters of the Madawaska River, um, it has had a profound impact on our identity, on, on language and the retention of that ancestral knowledge. Um, as we weren't afforded the ability to stay as a, as a distinct community together, we face the loss of our language. We've lost so much knowledge with the passing of our elders and them not being able to share that knowledge with us. Um, and at this point now, we're, it's a really fractured nation and it's actually really, really hard to belong to this nation in such, such a time. Um, but it's not lost on me that there are many Algonquin folks here in this room and together we're, we're part of that community. One of the most significant things about not moving to the Algonquin of Pequotnagon Reserve is that we were not afforded the ability to have Indian status under the Indian Act because we didn't go. It was simply that. We just weren't registered on that magical little list of the Indian Register. It has taken until just this year for, for my family, for my father to get his status and my status card is on the way. But it's something really hard to grapple with. Do I need a status card in order to be an indigenous person? I don't, but it's a lot easier to be able to say, this is who I am and you cannot contest this anymore. And so with, with all of this, all of this story, including Thompson's story, including um, this little tiny bit of Algonquin people's history that I've been able to share with you, why does it matter? What does it change now that you've been able to hear this? We know Thompson's story. We know what he saw. We know the places that stirred some inspiration deep in his soul. We know the gifts that he brought to the world through being able to bring Algonquin Park to people um, first in Canada and really like kind of give that Canadian identity but then go even further. Um, Thompson continues to inspire this deep love of the place that we call Algonquin Park that so many of us hold close. But now you know a story that's not often told, or at least little tidbits of the story. I could talk for the whole day if you really wanted to. But the point is, this is one story of many that we need to listen to. If we listen, it helps to better understand the complexities that exist in our world and the different layers of history and how they fit together, and also to be able to point out those injustices that exist, as well as um, you know, the, um, the ways that we, can, we benefit, really, from colonial society. And so, in the spirit of today, which is Canada's Day for Truth and Reconciliation, I do want to touch really quickly on the ideas of truth and reconciliation. We know that this like, truth and reconciliation, Canada's era of reconciliation, it calls on us to take action. We can no longer sit idly by and not do anything. It's not enough. It's not enough, and we'll probably call you out on it as well. 
Truth and reconciliation is something that needs to be practiced. This story that I've shared with you today, it's an exercise in truth telling. I've told you my story to the best of my ability, or at least those little tidbits of story, um, but it's an inclusive history. It's one of those more full histories that makes place for indigenous presence. We have always been here. We have always been on this land. This inclusive history is a way of reasserting ourselves back into our ancestral territory where we've always been and where we deserve to be honored and recognized. And so what is reconciliation? What does it mean to reconcile within Canada's reconciliation era? And really, whose responsibility is it? It's not ours. It's not the responsibility of Indigenous peoples to reconcile. We have nothing to reconcile with. But that's your responsibility as, as folks who have been here for generations on this land. And I, I will say too, you know, as settlers on, on these lands, I know that you don't have bad intent. I know that your ancestors who came here did not have bad intent because I'm also of settler ancestry. I know my ancestors came here as a way to escape religious and cultural persecution um, and that it is now their home, right? It's, it's again, I, I make that joke of I'm the literal embodiment of how well we got along. So I understand then I can reconcile with the fact that Algonquin Park is both Anishinaabe Aki, Anishinaabe territory, and Algonquin Park, Thompson's Algonquin Park. And I think that, you know, the, the whole point of this is to love and care for these lands together for all of those future generations. I love Tom Thompson's work because he loved Algonquin Park. Um, as my dear friend Alyssa Barty, who's a brilliant photographer and belongs to Kanyakaha community of uh, Tyndanega Mohawk territory, said this morning, there's work to do, and today is one day of 365 days out of the year. So I want you all to take from this whatever might have resonated, but then do something with it. Learn the stories, listen to us, listen, learn, and take up your responsibilities to the lands that you call home and the lands where we've always been. These responsibilities are not optional as no matter where you go, you are on indigenous land. And miigwech, thank you. <laughs> Christine, thanks so much for the humbling and clarifying words. Um, it, hearing you talk about Algonquin Park, you know, I hope um, for our settler visitors today, it's kind of moving the furniture around in your head a little bit um, because, you know, for so many settler people, Algonquin Park is synonymous with Tom Thompson. It, the way that, uh, Bonnie, I'm reminded of how, you know, when we started working on uh, From Water to Water, A Way Through the Trees, was um, partly the desire for us to acknowledge the, the history before the Michaels decided to build a, a gallery here on this land. That is not the history of the site. And you know, your work really helped to illuminate that and you know, really get people oriented in the right way at the beginning of their journey into the museum. So thank you for, for walking us through that and for your very beautiful essay in the book. And I, I just wanted to mention that Moose in the Moonlight is just about the only painting that Thompson ever made of an animal. And it was so interesting to me that when I spoke to you first about your essay, you were like, well, I know which one's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was this beautiful painting. So well, I think if anyone's seen a moose, a moose at, night, at night, that's yeah. what their bums look like. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we all know. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Christine. And Bonnie has some um, slides for us and some an opportunity to have a conversation now with Christine. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for coming today. Thank you to those who are wearing orange. Uh, it means a lot to see this. It's in solidarity uh, with us uh, who are today suffering just a little bit. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about landscape. I'm uh, not an art historian, I'm an artist, but um, coming from this place, this beautiful place, as Sarah mentioned, uh, Eastern Canada. Uh, it's hard not to uh, remark on the beauty of the land. And of course, the painters who came here from Europe remarked on it copiously and eloquently. Tom Thompson, of course, one of the founders of um, a, a brand new way of looking at land here in Canada. 
But I wanted to say that um, there was an older pictorial tradition uh, before Tom and his friends got here. And I wanted to remind us of that older pictorial tradition today. So if you could show my first slide, please, she. Oh, wait, I have it here, right? OK, yeah. I'm not very good at this. <laughs> um, you know, landscape in the European tradition is easel painting in oils, typically. Um, in Anishinaabe tradition, the land is the easel. And uh, this is called a, pit a pictograph. It's located on um, the shores of Lake Superior in Agawa Canyon. Some of you may have uh, seen this place or been to this place. In order to look at this glyph, you have to uh, walk along the rock. And sometimes your feet get wet because the, the lake is literally lapping at the edges of this cliff. You have to hold on to a chain that has been attached to the face of the cliff to keep yourself from falling into Lake Superior. This tells me that the people who this work was intended for were traveling in canoes. They were on the water. This is Mishu Pishu. He's the uh, great water panther and appears as a uh, symbol, a sign, and a um, naming, a claiming of land all across um, Ontario. Not sure how to do this. This is a map from a book that was published in 1962. The author is Selwyn Dudney. He was a graduate of OCAD, then Ontario College of Art. He was not a native person, um, but uh, an avid canoe um, paddler, and had in his journeys in, in Northern Ontario noticed these paintings on the cliffs and thought, you know what, there's something of art historical importance here. It was quite a radical thought at that time um, in 1962, of course, Indigenous people in Canada had only just achieved the right to vote in federal elections. Until that time, we were not considered uh, citizens of this country. And so for Selwyn Dudney to acknowledge uh, that there was an art form here and that it was widespread and that it had a singular... Mm, a singular um, continuity of subject matter, of material, and of purpose was something that was outside um, most of the consciousness of Canadians at that time. We were still considered uh, part of the flora and fauna of this country. Selwyn um, applied for and received a Canada Council grant to uh, travel by canoe with his son to map the instances of this land art. I don't want to call it landscape because I have a problem with landscape and I have a problem with that European concept and I don't know where uh, this work fits within that um, art history. So we'll call it land art. And this is one of his maps. Every black dot on that map represents an important site mapped by Dudney and his son himself um, of um, Anishinaabe art. And this is Western Ontario, Lake Superior. Could we see the next slide? This is um, Eastern Ontario. So you see Lake Ontario there, Lake Huron. Uh, the sites in this part of our province are much sparser. We don't often uh, come across. And I'm not sure why. Um, I'm really interested. Like, I'd like to apply for a Canada Council grant myself and go and explore this because I'm, I'm very curious about the extent of, um, of rock art uh, in eastern Ontario. 
I want to show you where Algonquin Park is. It's important for me to show you that because I want, I want to underline and emphasize the extent of this art practice in this province before the advent of European settlers here in this territory. Just south of Algonquin Park, you'll see a little triangular black mark. That is the site of the Peterborough petroglyphs. Could we see that next slide? And in this case, these aren't um, pictographs, these aren't paintings, these are carvings on the rock. This is engagement with land in a way that landscape painters of the European tradition do not engage. This is a, um, a kind of embodied um, um, familiarity, um, family, that's what that word means, relation, uh, with the land that we don't often see in Western style landscape painting, but which I contend we still see in contemporary Anishinaabe painting and contemporary Anishinaabe art. And I would point to the pictures around you in this gallery to show these symbols, this language, this homage to land, being practiced in the works of uh, Norval Morisot, behind me, Daphne Ojig. I would also point you to contemporary artists of um, Anishinaabe and other um, native um, nations across this country who are also practicing an homage to the land, not to represent the land, not to paint it as a scenic or picturesque um, feast for the eye, but actually to express that that is our mother and that those beings, those are our brothers and our sisters. I'd like to acknowledge my mother just now. I'm sorry if I'm emotional. My mother was incarcerated from the age of six at the Spanish residential school. She's no longer with me. I believe she's here in spirit and I I just want to acknowledge Norma Mayawasige. Tell me, Gretch. Thank you, Bonnie, for sharing that with us today. Um, I mean, Truth and Reconciliation Day is, um, you know, un un I think understood by many to be a day of celebration but it, it also has this profound gravity to it as a day, and a day when those of us of settler heritage feel, you know, feel deeply uh, the darkness of our legacy on this land. And um, yeah, so thank you for taking us there. I'm wondering, um, Christine and Bonnie, if you have things that you've been thinking you wanted to ask each other today, or, um, if you have something to say to what Bonnie just said. I mean, the first thing is, Bonnie, if you want to know some pictograph sites around Algonquin Park and area, I know of a few. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they, they're not, they weren't on that map at that point, so perhaps mm -hmm. he, didn't, he just simply didn't get there yet. And, mm -hmm. and there, are, there are a number of them that um, you, know, you can no longer see, but still, you know, like they, they may have... Um, the, the parts of the rock may have dropped into the water mm -hmm. um, and they've just faded over time, but they are still there. Mm -hmm. And I make a point of visiting them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that I noticed uh, in doing research about the, um, the rock paintings, as um, Selwyn Dudney titled them, um, is that they couldn't figure out how, what kind of paint those ancient ones were using. And research has been ongoing since the 1960s to try to determine um, what the heck they used <laughs> to make that, those pictures last so long. 
they are thousands of years old. Uh, the ones that I showed at the very beginning of this slideshow are um, on, f directly facing, they are on the north shore of Lake Superior. They are battered by wind and waves and ice and snow and every manner of weather you can imagine. And yet they are clear and strong and beautiful. So there's been a lot of, and, and you know it's so interesting because of course there's also been research about Tom Thompson's palette and what he used and how did he get his colors. And you know, there's been an awful lot of research about that. And I just wanted to say, you know, these, um, the emergence of indigenous art as an art form and its history as it can be inscribed in Canadian art history is also part of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And it is part of the work of, of the museums and of the museum's cur curators to understand that we need this research too. We need to know um, what they were using, what technologies and sciences they were employing uh, to make these beautiful artworks. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think when you look at this work that's carved into the rock and you talk about your difficulties with the word landscape, I think it's because the tradition of European landscape painting is about a kind of a awe and a sort of a distancing from a spectacle before you, whereas this is expressing the opposite of that. It's like an embeddedness, mm -hmm. like literally, physically an embeddedness of the image in the land itself. So there's no space of estrangement and wonder. And that, that's one of the reasons I, I love the installation downstairs that we were able to put together with, um, if you go right down here afterwards and go through into, have I got this right? Yes, through downstairs, you'll find three incredible works by uh, by, uh, by um, Rebecca Belmore that are cast from rocks. One kind of cone-shaped work is from um, uh, Newfoundland. The middle one is from north of Uppsala, Ontario, so northern Ontario. And then the third one is um, from the Canadian Rockies. And they, they are impressions made with aluminum onto the actual rocks. So they, they bear the, the touch of, you know, the texture of the earth itself. And we have those works installed in the middle of the sketches by the Group of Seven. And we're very blessed to have an amazing array of small oil panels by um, Tom Thompson and the Group of Seven. And what we love about that installation, and you can also see the forest outside mm -hmm. as you're standing in that room, is the way in which Belmore's works kind of discipline the Group of Seven and kind of put them in their place as newcomers who are mm -hmm. kind of running around. They've never seen anything like this before and they're making these vivid, extraordinarily highly charged visual records of their experience because this was new, new, new to people from somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. and, that, and that is the beauty of those sketches is the a sense of exploration and discovery in them of something that is uh, previously unknown, you know? But then the center of gravity in the room is, is Belmore's beautiful uh, rock castings that kind of just, they, they are like prehistoric, um, to use a complex term, but they, they kind of rise out of the floor and they feel like they ground the whole museum down there mm -hmm. in, in a deeper history. And yeah, don't miss that room when you're here today exploring the gallery with us because it it's kind of expresses what we're trying to achieve as well, to yes. honor this. Yes, I think that the, um, the artist's touch on the land is, is what's really important. And you see this in Belmore's work and, and in this work. Um, you don't see that in Tom Thompson. He's touching a canvas with paint. It's a really different relationship mm -hmm. to, um, to art making. But I wanted to ask Christine something about um, what you talked about in your in your presentation about looking in, that your family was forced to move away from where you had sprung up and now can only look in across this imaginary line. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about how can, <laughs> might be a really naive question, but how can we fix this? I think we have a long way to go. 
Um, even now, um, whether it's through a permit issued by the Ontario Park System or a permit issued by my own community, I still need permission to be able to move freely throughout my territory. And that is something difficult to know that I need to face every time I cross that imaginary line. And so, you know, thinking one of the first things that popped to mind, um, maybe 15 years or so ago, I'm, I'm an avid canoe tripper, and my I kind of my, my bragging thing is, you know, I did 16 canoe trips one summer. That was the most I've done. And one of those canoe trips, going into a more remote area of Algonquin Park, um, stopping to get a permit, and, and it was just a day use. And so if I'm there for any, you know, traditional, um, traditional practices, harvesting, you know, gathering and so on, or, or ceremonial, I should be able to be there. That's, that's what the rules are. I'm, I'm able to be there without a permit. But I did have one gate attendant once tell me, well, I guess I will let you in so long as you don't go anywhere within 30 meters of any campsite, anything that has been developed. And from that, that's always really stuck with me. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, coming on, on, the, on the shoulders of so many incredible Indigenous people who have really done the advocating to set the groundwork for me and, and my peers to be able to now do this work as well, um, I choose to just assert myself into those spaces. Mm -hmm. um, I don't... I don't know anyone that knows me. I know I'm a little, I'm a little bit stubborn, and so I will just simply go there and be in that place because I know that my my simple existence there that is an act of resistance, mm -hmm. and so it's really hard to reconcile with that. That I know I have to cross this line. I have to cross this line that has caused so much trauma, so much, so much grief, and has really led to this contemporary identity that we have today. That. You know, and, and not 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 in a sad way, but but there is a lot of trauma with it. That's simply a fraction of what our identity would have been even a hundred years ago. <laughs> but then balancing it out with um, the wonderful community that exists in Algonquin Park, I, I can't really separate myself from those two those two pieces because, uh, as I had mentioned, Algonquin Park is something that has shaped me. The people. Um, who I kind of care most about and hold close, they're also so connected to Algonquin. But it is simply in this moment being able to sit and sort of reconciling with those truths mm. and then finding a way to continue moving forward. But it's, it's really hard to sit there and, and like stare at that boundary line and just know the weight, and, and it's really in knowing the weight of the story, and knowing the story, um, I think it allows me to kind of sift through it, and that's why with a lot of the work that I do, I make sure that others know that story, so that they're able to also be in those spaces to be able to hold that as well, too. Mm -hmm. I think that's important for people to know, and, and that, that application of story and that, that knowing a full story um, do that wherever you go. If you're traveling somewhere, if you're going to, you know, say a national park in the States, find out what that, that history is. Find out that full history. It is your responsibility to seek that out. Otherwise, you can't be fully present in that place without knowing all that you can possibly gather together while you're there. It's a great unveiling to me, and I just hadn't thought about it, but that the creation of the national park system in Canada was really about preserving land for settler exploitation of resources and recreation of settler people on those lands. Because there was so much fear, it was like, well, if there's indigenous people here, it, you know, like I think that there's, uh, it's not about preserving nature mm -hmm. and animals, and it was not about that. And I hadn't kind of fully put that together in my head until we started talking with each other and, and you know, you were helping me to learn about the history of the park. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's there's been times, I, I worked at one of the busiest access points in Algonquin Park and without folks knowing, you know, that I am an Algonquin person, um, they would often say things like, you know, oh, like those Algonquins, they over harvest this and that. We don't over harvest. I don't fish, but I know a lot of folks who do who are non-Indigenous who take more than their limit all the time. Mm -hmm. And so it's really interesting that that mindset yeah. still continues and it's more present, I think, than we realize. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm reminded of the history of Banff National Park, mm. which is a rather 
dreadful story as well. And the way that the land was cleared of the original inhabitants in order to make a, play, a playground for, um, for non-native people and that there was actually a gate at the, at the, at the entrance to Banff um, where you had to, uh, if you were an, a native person, you were not allowed to go through. So it's, it is part of that, um, the parkification mm -hmm. of indigenous land, and crown land. It's complicated mm -hmm. and unraveling this and trying to gain access to our own places um, is a very, very long and arduous work. And we need help to do that. We need allies to, to stand with us. Um, it's, it's not a violent thing we're asking for. It's justice. Mm -hmm. Thank you so very much. Thank you, thank you um, everybody uh, for being here. And thank you for um, introducing us to certain aspects of the Algonquin that we would not otherwise have been aware of. Um, and I'm just wondering, because I know you, Bonnie, looked at pigments and ways of um, using um, uh, rock, and but at some point, when I look at the map that has done in 62, but everything that has been there before, where did the fracture happen? Or is there a fracture? Because now, as you say, we can look around, and it's been already decades that we look around at the art, and it is known as native um, Canadian art. But there is a big gap between what's on the on, on the screen there and what's on the wall, time-wise. So what mm -hmm. happened in between? Mm -hmm. I know kids were taken away from their parents. I know horrible, horrible, well, I learned, I did not know, I didn't leave them. I just arrived here not that long ago. Um, but how can you dig deeper, or, or what happened to the artistic expression that is, in yeah. my opinion, more or less a sign of life, not necessarily a desire to beautify the world. It's so you're asking about your own world. Your question, I think, is to the interval between the pictographic traditions and then when the record emerges again of objects being made by indigenous people and what happens in the interval. and. What happens in the interval is catastrophe. Yeah, uh, yeah but yeah. Bonnie Thank can you. explain that better than I can. You know, this um, this site at Peterborough was covered in moss. It was unknown. Um, it was a um, a pair of surveyors who were trying to lay a highway um, across this territory um, that happens to be just on the verge of the Canadian Shield, and um, so the story goes that these two surveyors uh, stopped to have lunch in the middle of a summer afternoon. They set down their, their packs and their equipment and stretched out on this moss-covered rock. And one of them happened to kick a bit of the moss away and saw a mark on the rock. And they mm -hmm. peeled it back and... Um, Lo and behold, there were more marks. And they peeled it back more, and they ended up peeling back a, a, a space about the size of this cleared platform here. And they realized that they had found something of great importance. Mm -hmm. They ran back to Peterborough, and they went to the newspaper there. It was the Peterborough Examiner, I believe. This would have been in the late 1950s, I think. Um, and the Peterborough Examiner came with a photographer the next morning with the two um, surveyors. 
and took photographs. And during the course of that afternoon with the reporter, they pulled back even more of the moss and discovered that it was even more extensive than they had originally thought. The reporter went back and published his photographs and the story in the Peterborough Examiner the next day. And by the end of the week, it was international news. Mm -hmm. I think that um, the, the exhumation of, of this piece of art um, was an important moment in what you have termed the gap. Um, Morisot would have been um, acquainted with some of the glyphs because at the same time, people were creating um, birch bark scrolls. And because of his um, parentage and his education in his family, he was aware of the way of making these marks. This is really um, an early written language. But when these came out, printed on the rock, like carved into the rock, um, I do believe that this had a, um, a very climatic, climactic um, impact on artists, on Anishinaabe artists. And because it had leapt across into the consciousness of non-Indigenous people because of the coverage in the paper, it suddenly became okay to make these marks. Prior to that, you know, we, our people were not allowed to make these, um, to make objects with this language on it or to exchange those things, to create them. Uh, there were laws prohibiting uh, the, the exchange of this knowledge. But in 1958, everything changed because it was, in the, it was in the world news. And very shortly after that, the potlatch laws were repealed. And suddenly we see a flowering of indigenous art and indigenous awareness um, awakening in our country. Thank you for that question. Yes, of course. So just to, to add a bit to that, you know, Bonnie had, um, had touched on the point that there was a time where we weren't able, we were not allowed, allowed to make that artwork, um, oftentimes unless we were selling it, selling it at fairs or selling it, you know, for, for whatever event there might be. But there are pieces of, you know, birch bark work, um, quill work that exists, um, and it's often dated as well, too. Um, I know of, of pictographs. The last one I know of in Algonquin territory was, was painted uh, maybe about 150 years ago now, um, was a rock along the Kitchissippi, along the Ottawa River, and that's one of the last ones that I know of, I think, just across Anishinaabeg territory um, that had been painted. And with that, it's certainly not because we don't want to create it is because we had to we had to really fight our way to be able to create, um, as we had talked about before. You know, we were considered to be you know, the same as plants and animals, and someone's people to be managed by others. Um, but again, you you have these these people who have come before us who set those foundations so that we're able to come back to those practices. And I think it's also important to note too, you know, let's, let's make sure to not keep indigenous peoples in that historic time period. We evolve, we change, we adapt with new technologies in ways that best serve our communities. And so maybe while we're not creating pictographs and petroglyphs the same way, I am very hopeful that we get back to that practice. Because I'll tell you the amount of times that I've been out on the land in a canoe and how I thought, how cool would it be to be able to know how to make that paint and to be able to leave those marks in those good ways so that those stories are there six, seven, 15, 100 generations from now. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the places I've seen some art, um, it's not engraved into the stone but into birch bark mm. is in the Canadian Canoe Museum and along the edge of the uh, 
Gunnels, sometimes there are decorations that have been made many, many years ago. And Christine, one of the slides you showed was of a birch bark canoe. Uh, could you tell us something about the significance of that particular canoe, please? Mm. Thank you, Rory. Um, so the, uh, the photo that I had up is uh, a picture of my father and I in the inaugural uh, paddle of the, the Madawaska canoe, um, the name given by Camp Pathfinder. We launched it on Source Lake um, just a little over a year ago, um, Source Lake being the headwaters of the Madawaska River. The paddles that we're using, though you can't really see them in this photo, um, those paddles were my grandfather had a hand in creating those about 50 years ago or so, and they'd never touched water until we took them out with that canoe. This birch bark canoe is the first canoe that was built in, um, in my community, by my community, in well over 100 years in this way, in Algonquin Park. And that was made possible because of partners, because of folks who have stepped up to be those meaningful allies and you know, sort of put their money where their mouth was. We were able to bring in Chuck Commanda, who is a uh, Nishnabic uh, canoe builder who learned from his father, or his grandfather, William Commanda, who some of you may know um, from Kitakan Sibi. And that has brought together my family and my community in some really wonderful ways. Um, you know, it's it's one thing to have been able. I'm I'm still this this much you know past that first paddle, still unable to really put into words what it means to share that experience with my father, but then also to share that experience with with elders in my community, who have then since my my cousin Dan is here, Elder Dan Bowers um, and Ethel Lavalley, who are actually they've gone on to build canoe number two. We just need to launch it now. So this, this photo and kind of that, that whole entire process, um, that's a reclamation of those ancestral practices within our territory. We should have always been doing this, but here we are. It might take some time, but we get back to it eventually when we're ready and we're gonna run with it and we're gonna keep on working with birch bark and reclaiming those practices. Thank you, Rory. It's uh, fascinating and so important to hear about the complex and troubling history of the creation of Algonquin Park and Banff Park and, and all their, our legacy of, of um, how these spaces were created. Um, and, but, but nevertheless, I, I think that um, there's, there's sort of a common interest in, in future preservation of, of land and future protection of land from, from, um, from uh, 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 destructive development and so on. I, I think there's a, there's, there, there are emerging practices of in, indigenous land protectors uh, being recognized and, and, and encouraged and, and supported by, by, by governments. And I wonder if you, if you could comment on those, on those current um, uh, attempts to, to try to do, do a similar thing better, making, making protected areas in a, in a better way. Um. Last week, I um, was involved in a project for Nuit Blanche and uh, became engaged with uh, some plant material at High Park. And because of the work that I did there, um, I was introduced to a group of indigenous volunteers who are working at Grenadier Pond. They're called the Turtle Protectors. And they've also formed an, an, an alliance with another indigenous group. They're called the Indigenous Land Stewardship Circle. And these people are working in a non-official way. They, they have got a certain amount of um, recognition from the City of Toronto and the Parks Department from the Toronto Regional Conservation Authority. But those three bodies are really the governing um, agents uh, within this uh, very fragile space, in, kind of in the center of Toronto called High Park and Grenadier Pond. Um, I believe that um, the only way to protect what it remains of uh, pristine um, country in Canada, the land, is to return it to indigenous people. And I believe that in that way, and we have never refused to share or to deny access to anyone 
to our land. We have never refused um, a, a just and equitable uh, division of the resources of that land. But I believe that the true stu stewards of our country, if we are to protect it from the predations of capitalism and untrammeled development, is return it to indigenous people. I can't quite recall the exact, you know, numbers, but if you look at, you know, the land that remains within indigenous stewardship and the biodiversity that exists within that little, little percentage of land, it is extreme. We know that the ways that we, that we are part of land, that they are relations with us, they're, they're part of family, um, that's a much different approach to looking at land as something to take from only. Um, there are certain protocols that we have and that sort of dictate the way that we interact. And you know, I, I've been doing a lot of a lot of thinking about this in, in recent weeks, and it's just the land holds us in really incredible ways, so long as we allow ourselves the ability to have those relationships. And so in learning from Indigenous peoples and the ways that we approach and understand land as kin, as relation, um, there's something to be learned from that. But when you're talking about, uh, you know, these, these national or park systems, we are making steps. We are moving forward. We are finding ways of, of certain, you know, inclusion of Indigenous knowledges and, and individuals in that management. Um, but unless it is true and full co-management or practicing land back, um, it does fall short. There's a lot of lip service that's being done. And as I had mentioned before, you know, like, we're probably going to call you out on that sort of lip service. Uh, a good example of co-management within the Ontario Park System is Petroglyphs Provincial Park. The involvement that uh, the Michisagig uh, communities have, particularly Curve Lake with the Petroglyphs, um, it's incredible. They're, they're able to go to those sites whenever they need and practice ceremony whenever they need. And the staff who work there are absolutely thrilled that they can hold those relationships with community. And I think that that's what we need to prioritize more are those relationships and, and that good-hearted relationship as opposed to finding ways to leverage that land to make money off of the land. strikes me that may be the perfect place to stop, unless there are other burning questions. I think we've been up here for a while. Um, I wanted to, to sort of gather our thoughts together at the end here with a quote from Richard Wagamese, who I just came across this quote the last few days while I was thinking about your work, Christine, because it's one of your favorite quotes, I think. Hmm. And it's a very famous one. We are a story, all of us. What comes to matter is the creation of the best possible story we can while we're here, you, me, us, together. When we can do that, and we take the time to share those stories with each other, we get bigger inside. We see each other. We recognize our kinship. We change the world, one story at a time. So thank you so much for, for being with us, and being so present today. <laughs> <laughs>